Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the most powerful and in my opinion, the best mini PC that I've ever got a chance to review on the channel. This thing is an absolute powerhouse. It stays nice and cool, it stays quiet, and it handles everything that I've thrown at it so far. From 4K and 1440p AAA gaming, to high-end emulation upscale to 4K and even sometimes beyond. Now recently on the channel, we took a look at the Nook XI5 from Menace Forum, but today we're taking a look at their most powerful offering, the Nook XI7. So with this one here, we get an 8-core, 16-thread i7 CPU paired up with an RTX 3070. Now if you're interested in the i5 version, we get a 6-core, 12-thread i5 over there with an RTX 3060. But like I mentioned, this is their most powerful offering right now, and it's an absolute beast. And of course, in this video, we're going to be comparing the real-world performance and benchmarks with the i5 version. But first things first, let's go ahead and get this thing out of the box. Now, obviously, this is a super thin form factor gaming PC, and it does come with a stand. This sits vertically in the stand, and unfortunately, there's no feet to set it horizontally. But personally, I really do think it looks super good sitting there on the desk. The front and rear of the Nook X is constructed of aluminum. The midsection is plastic, and on the rear, we've got plenty of ventilation. I really do like the grate system that they used here. It looks pretty good. But given the form factor here, we're working with some very powerful components inside of this thing. Now inside of the box, you're obviously going to get the Nook X, whether you pick up the i5 or the i7 version. We've got our stand and a 230 watt power supply. Also comes with an HDMI cable and some mounting hardware to mount that stand on the feet here. When it comes to I.O., up front here, we've got three full-size USB 3.2 ports, a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, and an SD card reader. This is a full-size SD card reader. Moving up a little more, we've got our power slash reset button. We've also got a gaming mode button. So basically, when you're in gaming mode, this is going to send more power to the GPU, allowing for higher clocks for longer periods of time. Moving around back, we've got our power input, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, full-size HDMI 2.1 port, and Thunderbolt 4. So we do have multiple displays out using Thunderbolt 4. And of course, since it is Thunderbolt, we could connect an external GPU, but I do think we've already got plenty of power here with that RTX 3070. Obviously, form factor here is super thin, but I did want to give you a quick comparison between the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. And keep in mind, my PS5 doesn't have the stand on it right now. But yeah, I mean, you can see how thin this thing is. It's about as tall as the PS5 with the stand on it, and the PS5 will overtake it just by a bit when the stand's included with that console. So it is falling in line with this gen's console sizes right now. I also wanted to give you a look at the internals here. It's actually really easy to get in here and upgrade the RAM and storage. It uses dual channel SODIMM RAM up to 3200 megahertz, and we've got two NVMe M.2 slots. Only one's gonna be populated if you end up picking up the non bare bones version, but upgrading the storage here, really easy. You can go up to two terabytes with each, bringing it up to a total of four terabytes in this PC. Now, the reason they were able to keep this thing so thin is because they're using mobile components in this unit, basically laptop parts. When it comes to that i7 CPU, it's a mobile variant, and the RTX 3070 is actually the laptop variant, so we don't need those giant cards in this thing. And it might turn some people off, but once you see the performance here, you're going to be blown away by what this thing can do. So when it comes to the specs of the Nook XI7, for the CPU, we've got the Intel i7-11800H. Now, I've taken a look at Intel's tuning utility. This is running at 45 watts with a boost up to 65, but you can kind of adjust that if you want to. It's got 8 cores, 16 threads, with a clock up to 4.6 gigahertz. Offers some really great gaming performance. The GPU is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070, and like I mentioned, this is the laptop variant, but we've got 8 gigs of GDDR6, and we've also got that boost button on the front of the unit. It supports up to 64 gigabytes of RAM, running at 3200 megahertz. We've got two M.2 NVMe slots in here. We can go up to 4 terabytes in total with those slots. Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and this is running Windows 11 right out of the box if you don't opt for the bare bones version but you do have the option from the website to pick it up bare bones, or you can go all the way up to 32 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte pre-installed on this unit. There's a couple in between with 16 and 256 up to 32 and 512. All right, so one thing I want to mention right off the bat, I will have gaming mode on when we're testing all of the games and emulators in this video, but overall, I mean, this thing's definitely super snappy. With the i5 version, I had no problem using it as an everyday desktop, and with the i7 version, Given that we have a more powerful CPU and GPU in this thing, it's going to do the same thing, even better. 
when it comes to comparing gaming performance between the i7 and the i5 version, throughout my testing I went with a few of the games on the same settings, but since we have more power with this, I jacked some of the settings up with most of the stuff that we're going to take a look at. But I'll give you an idea of what it did on the i5, and when we get to the benchmarks you can definitely see the difference there. But uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. First up, Spider-Man Remastered. Alright, so here it is at 1440p, very high settings, no DLSS. Now with the i5 version, I tested this at high settings, 1440p with no DLSS, and we got an average of 74 FPS. And with this here, we're actually getting an average of around 85 FPS. So even with higher settings over here, we're getting better performance, and you know, I expected it. We've got a better CPU and GPU, but don't get me wrong, the i5 version is still a stellar little unit. Before we test out some more games, I wanted to give you a look at some benchmarks. And first up, we've got Geekbench 5. At the top, we've got the i7 version, which we're taking a look at in this video. Single core on the CPU, 1464, multi, 8609. Coming ahead on the single and multi when you compare it to the i5 version. Moving over to some GPU benchmarks with 3D Mark Fire Strike. At the top, the i7 version coming in with a total score of 22,298. The i5 version, 19,054. And keep in mind, none of this is overclocked. I've just got the gaming mode button turned on, so there is room for improvement. And you can also go in and up the TDP on that CPU using Intel Tuning Utility. But the final one I have here is 3D Mark Time Spy. The Nook XI7 scored a 10,229, and the Nook XI5, 8,297. Obviously, we expected the i7 version beat out the i5 version. We've got a better CPU and GPU here, but let's go ahead and move back over to some more PC gaming. Here we have Halo Infinite, 1440p, high, same exact settings that I used with the i5 version. On that, we got an average of 79 FPS. And on the i7 version, we got an average of 87 FPS. I actually thought it would be a bigger jump, but you know, we're at 1440p high. The game still looks great, and it plays fine on both of these units. Next up, we've got Forza Horizon 5, 4K Ultra, and we're getting an average of around 68 FPS. Now, we still got resolution scale that we could use, or we could drop it down to 1440p. But personally, if I just go ahead and turn VSync on with this game, lock it at 60, it's going to be good to go at 4K, and it looks absolutely amazing. On the i5 version, it was hard pressed to run this at 4K, we did have dips under 60. God of War is another one that runs really well on this machine. 1440p, Ultra, no DLSS, we're getting an average of around 78 FPS. Not bad at all, but unfortunately this little thing just won't handle this game at 4K unless you drop it down to around medium settings with DLSS set to performance. Cyberpunk 2077, 1440p ultra settings with DLSS set to quality. Now we can actually run this with no DLSS, but we need to drop those settings down to medium if you want to run this at a constant 60. But with it set up like this, we got an average of 76 FPS out of it, which is fully playable and it still looks great. One I was really hoping we could do 4K with was Elden Ring, but here it is at maximum settings 1440p, running at a constant 60, looking great here. Unfortunately, in order to go to 4K with this, low settings. I mean, it's a huge jump between 1440 and 4K on these machines. Here's, here's The Witcher 3, 4K ultra settings, no hair works, and post-processing is set to as high as we can go. As you can see, we're right on the edge there at around 65 FPS, and I didn't see it drop below 60, but there's a chance it definitely could at 4K, totally maxed out. So if you did want to play this at 4K on this machine, I would just set it up for high settings. And the final game we have here is Doom Eternal 4K Ultra Settings. I didn't try Nightmare, I mean it still looks great at Ultra, and we can run this at over 80 FPS on average. And another thing a lot of people would be interested in with this machine is emulation. Now with the i5 version, we could do everything we wanted. 
We were able to do Wii U at 4K, PS3 at 4K, even Yuzu at 4K resolution, so this really isn't going to be any different. But I still wanted to show a few emulators running here, so first up we've got PS2 using PCSX2, 4K, DirectX 11 back in, running super smooth. Taking a look at some Xbox 360 emulation using the Zinnia emulator. By the way, this is the Canary build of Zinnia, so it's kind of in early access, but it works great. There's a lot of optimizations to this. A harder one to emulate is Red Dead, and a few months ago, on a system like this, we were hard-pressed to run this at 30 FPS. But now, on a system like this, with V-Sync turned off, we can even do Red Dead at over 60 FPS. And something like Forza 2, you can get up to 200 FPS out of that game with V-Sync off. And finally, PS3 using the RPCS3 emulator, 4K, Vulcan back in, Skate 3, running at a constant 60. Again, the Nook XI5 version with the RTX 3060 in it was also able to run this at 4K 60. So when it comes to emulation on either of these, I mean, they've got you covered. We can even do Switch with Yuzu, Wii U, you want to do some 3DS, these machines will definitely handle it. So with a machine like this being so thin and putting out this kind of performance, you figured it'd be super loud and really hot, but they've done a great job controlling the thermals and the fan noise with this. In fact, under normal desktop use with this thing right by me, I didn't even notice that it was on. And when I initially turned it on, I had to make sure it was actually coming on by looking at the LED because it's so quiet. But obviously we need to take a look at these CPU temps, and it does get a bit warmer than the i5 version, but not by much. Idle, we're averaging 38 degrees Celsius. Average gaming, 74, and the max that I saw this CPU hit was only 85 degrees Celsius, so we never hit thermal throttle through all of my tests. And another thing some people might be interested in is total system power consumption. Now these are definitely going to pull more power than a regular old mini PC with like a Ryzen APU because we've got a dedicated GPU, but at idle, we're around 28 watts. Average gaming, 170, and the maximum that I could get this to pull from the wall was 218 watts. On average, this does pull about 20 more watts than the i5 version does. So overall, the Nook X is definitely turning out to be my favorite mini PC so far that I've taken a look at on the channel, and if you're a regular viewer, you know we take a look at a lot of PCs, and it really comes down to having that dedicated GPU. Being able to play games at 1440p and 4K Ultra on a machine this thin is absolutely amazing, and after testing the i5 and the i7 version, I personally would probably go with the i7 version given that we get those extra cores and a better GPU, but the price difference on the bare bones really isn't that much between the two, at least at the time I'm making this video. There's only a $170 price difference between the Nook X i5 and the Nook X i7. But the i5 version did handle everything that I threw at it, 1440p high, and even 4K emulation was outstanding on that machine. But I'd personally like to know that I had a little extra power to work with, and those extra cores definitely help out in the end. But it's really up to you if you've been thinking about picking one of these up. You could always go and build something more powerful for around the same price, maybe even cheaper if you used used parts, but you're never going to get this form factor, and that's really where it is for me. I love the sleek design, it's cool, it's quiet, and it performs absolutely amazing. I mean, it handles everything that I want to do with this PC. But that's going to wrap it up for this video. If you're interested in learning more about this PC, I'll leave links in the description. And if there's anything else you want to see running on this, just let me know in the comments below. I definitely want to install SteamOS on this in the future. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you hit that subscribe button and maybe turn notifications on so you know when I post the next one. And like always, thanks for watching.